Evening, everyone. Um, good to be with you this evening. I want to talk to you about something that's been on my heart the last few days, just been meditating on it um, and enjoying thinking about it again. And it's what I call, or others too, I think, from commentaries, the gospel in a nutshell. The gospel in a nutshell. I don't know if you're um, aware of that phrase. Maybe those of you that are English is not your first language might not be aware of the phrase in a nutshell. But it's used when somebody um, uh, just makes a point or makes a comment that just sums everything up about that thing succinctly, accurately. So you would say, you know, you've got it in a nutshell. So it's something that is sort of like reduced, focused, but it, you've got it in a nutshell, means something that, that encompasses something very big, but just sums it up in a short, pithy comment. And so when we talk about the gospel in a nutshell, where would we go in the New Testament to find the gospel in a nutshell? Well, you might what one one of the gospels in a nutshell might be John three sixteen, most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that He sent His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the gospel, isn't it? In a nutshell, and that's why we use that verse so often in our evangelism. But I want to show you the gospel in a nutshell from Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. Now, for me, this really is the gospel in a nutshell, because it has more, it, it, it's pithy, it's only um, three verse, short verses, uh, but everything in the gospel is found in that. It really is the gospel in a nutshell. In fact, you might be surprised that this gospel in a nutshell that Paul speaks about is uh, got more contents than many people. If you ask them to say what the gospel is, if I was to say to you, give me the gospel in a nutshell. In other words, in, a, in two or three sentences, tell me exactly what the heart of the good news is, what the gospel is. I wonder what you would say. You might quote John 3, 16. I wonder what would you say? Give me the gospel. I, don't, I haven't got time for an hour or whatever. Give me the gospel in its essence. I wonder if you'd include everything here. I wonder. Uh, I think many don't, but here we go. So Galatians 4, verse 4 to 7, the gospel in a nutshell. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This, these um, four verses contain the fullness of the gospel in a concentrated form. And that's why it's so important for you to be aware. I don't know how aware you were of these verses, Galatians 4, 4 to 7. I'm sure you've read them, but where you were aware that commentators call it um, the gospel in a nutshell or the summary of Paul's gospel uh, right up till Galatians 4. We recently did a Emmanuel School of Ministry on it right up to Galatians 4. Paul has spoken about a lot, but this is summarizing his message. And so it really is an important passage for you to know, maybe maybe even learn off, off by heart, certainly to study. It's one of the most important few scriptures that's in, in, in the Bible. And so it's a gospel in a nutshell. There's a nutshell. It's got John 3, 16 in. But I'm saying that here in Galatians 4, verse 
chapter 4, verse 4 to 7, we have uh, the fullness of the gospel in a nutshell. And there I've summarized what the verses say in the fullness of time. God sends his son, born of a woman, under law, to redeem us from the law so that we might be adopted as sons and as sons, therefore, receive the spirit and therefore become heirs of God, heirs of God. So let's just go through um, some of these things that are in these 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 verses. And um, the first thing that we see in the gospel, uh, the, the, the gospel in an in a nutshell is where it says, but when the fullness of time had come, such an amazing phrase, so full of meaning. In other words, throughout time, when God created the world and time was set in motion, there was a clock ticking. And right at the beginning, right when God said, let there be, and there was, and time began, the clock was ticking for the fullness of time to come. And everything that took place, good, bad, evil, righteous, were all part of God's plan to lead eventually to the fullness of time. And so the beautiful thing about the Old Testament is that when you read the Old Testament, you see it pointing to the fullness of time, the prophets pointing to the fullness of time. The whole of the Old Testament and everything it contains is a preparation for the fullness of time when God would send his son, a preparation, almost like, you know, you go, you want to go and see a play in a theater. Well, before you can see a play in a theater, they have to have um, set the stage, don't they? And they set the stage. When the stage is set and ready, the performance can, can begin. And so in order for Jesus to be understood, he, uh, he had to come in context. There had to be a context for God's son to come. There had to be something where, where Matthew, Mark and Luke and the other New Testament writers could say, look, uh, uh, it was written this just as it was written. Look, this is what Jesus it means when Jesus is called the Lamb of God. Go back when it was written, the Lamb of God in Exodus, when it was put, the blood was put on the doorposts and the angel passed over. You see, all of that was preparation. How could we ever know what Jesus when John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? How could we even know what that means? unless we know of the Passover. And so everything that happened in the Old Testament, the record of, of, of human, human history, all of it was laying the groundwork and preparing us for the time when, when, when God would come. And we find this in Hebrews 1 as well. It also speaks about that in former times, God sent his prophets, but now, in this time, he has sent his son. The prophets had to come first. The Old Testament scriptures had to come first. The Exodus had to come first. The law had to come first. Abraham's covenant had to come first. The flood had to come first. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the restoration had to come first. The temple had to come first. If you, Moses had to come first, you see. So when the fullness of time came, God sent his son. So that's part of the gospel. The, the gospel has a background to it. There is a fullness. And when the time had come, the perfect time and everything was put in place in history, um, the right empire was in charge at the right time. Uh, Greek was the common language that would spread the gospel. It was all so perfectly orchestrated by God. And at that point, we see that God sent forth his son. That's the next statement. Isn't that amazing? God has a son. 
<laughs> saying that today gets a massive reaction from certain religions and for most people because if god has a son then we'd better listen to him if god sends his son then it's a very important act that have that that it, that, that that is about to take place so god has a son and god sent his son he didn't create his son it doesn't say god created his son it said god sent a son and then that son was born of a woman god god's son existed before he was born of a woman god sends and a woman gives birth god sends and a woman gives birth right there you have the doctrine that we call the incarnation that we are celebrating this advent coming on to christmas day that god sent his son and he was born of a woman born of a virgin so god sends his son he's god's son he's god but also he's born of a woman he's a human being he's god god's son being sent but now he's born of a woman he's fully god and he's fully human but notice it says born of a woman this again is an ama amazing part of the gospel born of a woman it didn't say born of a man it didn't say born of joseph did it and when you look at the genealogies uh in the old testament um and mostly as, as well in the new testament it, it records the male doesn't it it records, records the genealogies of the old testament says so and so the man begat so and so begat so and so begat so and so and it's the male who begets it's the male line that is followed only occasionally is a woman mentioned for for great importance but the line is male because the seed comes from the male and in the chapter before in chapter three uh um paul has been speaking about the seed of abraham that god promised that in your seed the nations of the world will be blessed okay seed is male seed is male in fact in the greek um in the in the greek original in chapter three the word seed is sperm you right you don't get more 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 biological than that sperm sperm the greek word sperm means seed and sperm uh, as well and so this idea that that Jesus was born of a woman, but not of a sperm of man. This is important because Adam was the head of humanity. And through him, the genealogies trace the line all the way down to Jesus. But Jesus is not of the seed or sperm passed down, if I can put it that way, of Adam. He's not that he is not the seed of Adam. Why? Because that seed was corrupted. That seed was corrupted. And so um, Jesus became the second Adam, the head of a whole brand new uh, human race. That it was not that, that uh, and he was not tainted from sin. Now, this means uh, this means that 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 he is sin free adam free if i can put it like that way he's as human as adam but he's not as fallen as, as adam he's as human as we were well, sorry he he is as human as we are but he's not sinful like we are born of a woman that's where he got his humanity but not of the line of adam a break in the line a new line has occurred a, a new, if I can put it this way, a new human race has a has occurred, a new line, a new line. So fully God, fully man. Then, then, <clears throat> then the next thing we find that he was born under the law, under the law. Again, the fullness of time under the law. What does that mean? Well, sin is punished by God and the law, the law. Uh, shows us the sinfulness of sin 
People understood sin before the law came. Of course they did. If we see that in the Bible, people knew what was right and wrong. But when the law came, it called sin by name. When the law came, it codified what sins were and how holy was God. When the law came, it explained the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man in 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 great in great um, detail. Ceremony, uh, uh, holiness in many different spheres of life. Holiness in ceremonial, holiness in social, um, and, and, and holiness in, in life. And so when Jesus came, he was born under the law. And the law shuts everybody up under sin. That's why the law is important. There's, there's no excuse. I mean, there wasn't a, an excuse before the law, but there's certainly no excuse when the law came. No excuse for anybody. Not even an excuse uh, that will get you off if you don't even know about the law, if you've never heard of the law. And this is important because uh, you, just because you don't know about a law doesn't mean that, that, that you can break it without being punished. So if I didn't know, if I went to France in my car and uh, didn't know the speeding limits in France and wasn't aware of the laws or the speeding limits and broke the law, uh, when a French gendarme pulls me over and says to me, you have broken our French laws and therefore you must pay a fine. What do you think he would say if I said, well, the thing is, I'm English. I, I, I don't even know what your laws are. He'd say ignorance of the law is not an, an, an excuse. And so Jesus was born under the law, which is quite amazing because he was the he, he through the angels gave this law. He, through mediation of the angels, gave this law and the law condemns everyone in, in sin. And the law shows that we can't by our own effort uh, reconcile ourselves to God. We just aren't good enough to be accepted by God. And we're all sinners. We all short, fall short of the glory of God. So the law is the big stick that, that shows us that we cannot, we have no excuse, no excuse. And we have no ability in our sinful nature to obey the law so that we'll be accepted by God. Uh, the law, in fact, only brings a curse. It, it, if, the, if, if we could live, if we could obey the law, it would bring a blessing. But because no human being uh, from Adam's seed can obey the law, it only brings greater awareness of condemnation and greater awareness that we need to be saved. So Jesus was born under the law. To redeem those that were under the law, the next thing said. So he was born on the law to save us from the punishment that the law speaks over, over the whole humanity in such an incredible, clear, uh, undisputable way. And what did he do? Well, as a human being, not of the seed of Adam, he obeyed the law and, and he obeyed it all his life. 24 7 he obeyed it in thought and word and deed he interpreted the law perfectly everybody's arguing the pharisees and the sadducees about what this law meant and what that law meant he interpreted it per perfectly he was under his whole life and heart and actions and words were under the microscope of the old testament law waiting as it were, for one moment when he would slip for one second in a tiny way and then he would not have fulfilled the law. But he fulfilled the law perfectly. If the law was a final examination, which it is, the, the law is a final examination to see if you'll get into heaven or not, a final examination to see if you are righteous enough to, to, to live with God in heaven. It's a final examination. And uh, Jesus took that final examination and he passed it. He passed it with 100 percent. But he didn't pass it for himself. Because he was already 100 percent. He was the one that set the exam. 
he passed it for us. He was born under the law, under its supervision. He, he didn't have to be under the law. He was, he was the lawgiver. He chose voluntarily to be under the law. He is the Lord of the law, but he chose to submit to the law, not for himself, but for you and for me. He, if, if, if it was the final examination, it was like this. Jesus took the exam, but he put your name on the examination sheet. He passed the test and all those that trust in him that he did this, they get the grade. How about that? How about if I came to you and gave you a PhD in maths? And I said, here, I award to you a PhD in maths. And you said, wait a second, I've, I've not sat, I couldn't do a PhD in maths. I couldn't even do a GCSE in maths. Why, why are you giving me a PhD in maths? Well, I'm just looking at the final examination of the PhD and it's got your name on it. It's got your name on it. Oh, no, no, I, I, I didn't take it. It's got your name on it. No, I'm telling you, I didn't. It's got your name on. It's official. You've got a PhD in maths. All right. And and Jesus did that for us with the law. He did it. He fulfilled it, got our name and we got we by faith got saved. So he redeemed all who are under the law. Now, why did he do that? It wasn't just that he died on the cross for our sins so that we could be righteous with his righteousness. He fulfilled the law on our behalf and he died so that our sins would be forgiven to redeem us, to buy us back from the judgment of the law. And uh, and then what happened? Well, there was a further purpose. It was so that we might receive adoptions as sons. So he's, he redeemed us by dying on the cross, fulfilling the law on our behalf, dying for our sins. But he didn't just do that and leave it like that. He did this to redeem us from the law so that we might be adopted as sons. And often in our gospel preaching, we talk about the fact, you know, you, you, you know, uh, we're all sinners and, um, all of us have have fallen short of uh, the glory of God and uh, and left by ourselves. We would be judged uh, guilty. But God sent his own son to take our sins upon himself and he paid for our sins. And when we believe that he died for our sins, we are forgiven. And we go to heaven. We give your life to Jesus right now. Will you say that prayer? Yes. I thank you, Lord, that you died for me. I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that you are Lord, that you took my sins on the cross and I trust in you and I believe in you. Thank you for dying for me. And then we go, congratulations. You you are now, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you are now, had your sins forgiven, you are reconciled with God. Congratulations. Well done. Off you go. No, no. That now qualifies you for what? To receive adoption as sons. So in this uh, gospel, in a nutshell, uh, probably what I've spoken to you before, you, you, you know already. But do you know that part of the gospel, in a nutshell, is to receive adoption as sons? Doesn't matter if you're a female or a male to receive adoption as sons. What does Paul mean by that? He means that not only are you part of God's family now, but you you can inherit. So you were outside the family of God, enemies of God, judged by the law, sinners. But Jesus came as a human being, fulfilled the law's requirement for you and then died for your sins so that when you believe you can receive adoption as a son. And this is quite a big um, doctrine in the New Testament, the adoption, the doctrine of adoption. And not many people teach on this and what it means to be adopted. You are predestined to Ephes uh, is it Ephesians. Think Ephesians. You are pre predestined to be adopted. 
Romans understood adoption in the Greek world. Paul would, would have understood this as well, that adoption qualifies you to inherit. So in the Roman world, uh, they didn't just adopt babies. Grown men would adopt other grown men as their sons legally. So you find that Roman emperors would choose their successor and not necessarily would it be their flesh and blood son. OK, but they might choose somebody that they have no um, no uh, genetic link to. Uh, and that 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 man could even even be older than them if they wanted. And that Roman emperor could adopt that person legally as his son and then he would be treated as if he was his very son in all legal respects and some emperors became emperors because an emperor adopted them on purpose so that they could inherit after they died and it wasn't just emperors rich people could adopt somebody that they wanted and the moment they adopted somebody even though it wasn't part of their bloodline that person would receive full rights so when we were adopted into the family of god although we came from the seed of adam we have now been adopted uh cleansed forgiven taken off the curse of the law taken out of the curse of the law and now we've been adopted into a new family a new family and even in britain i mean i was adopted as a child i was adopted by uh, my mother by my my mother and father uh who i was not related to at all and then i was adopted as a, a three-month-old child and they signed the adoption papers and from that moment uh they were my mother and my father legally and they had all the legal rights of a parent over me and i uh and i received all the legal rights of being of being their their child and so god has done that with it us this is the gospel in in a nutshell but it doesn't even stop there because it says that uh to redeem those that are under the law you couldn't be adopted as a sinner you, you couldn't be adopted in sin sin had to be dealt with you couldn't be adopted and be part of god's holy family cursed so that had to be dealt with redeemed and you were but now you've been adopted you're you're officially in god's family uh the new humanity the new the new human race that comes from jesus by by faith and now and now because you're a son god has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying abba father so here we have the Holy Spirit. We've got the Trinity here, the Holy Spirit. Because you're sons, you're cleansed by faith in Jesus's blood and by his blood. You're redeemed from the curse of the law. You're adopted into his family. Guess what? You qualify for the Holy Spirit to come into your life, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And here, especially in this verse, it talks about the assurance of the Holy Spirit. Abba, Father, this Holy Spirit witnesses to our spirit, Romans 8 says, that we are sons of God, crying, Abba, Father, we have this link to God through the Holy Spirit. So the, the work of the Holy Spirit and receiving the Holy Spirit and being filled of the Holy Spirit is very much part of the gospel. And and you, because you're a child of God, you receive the Holy Spirit. It comes afterwards because you're a child of God. You can receive the Holy Spirit and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And God is your father. And then I don't I don't need to go on too long because it's 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 uh, not a long teaching tonight. So I'm coming to an end, but just wanted to highlight this for you. Uh, here we go. Adopted, received the spirit. And no longer a slave to sin, but a son, whether you're a, in those days, a woman could not inherit. But in those days, Paul said, that you can inherit from God. There's no slave. There's no freed man. There's no Greek. There's no Gentile. There's no um, uh, male. There's no female. Because in Christ, we're all sons, meaning 
we can all inherit. And there we are, an heir through God. So being an heir is part of the gospel message. What does that mean? It means that not only are we saved, not only are we adopted into a new family, not only is the Holy Spirit sent into our hearts to bring, bring us assurance and everything else, our connection to God, but not that we're not but we're not a slave, but we are sons that can inherit. And that means that we are spiritually like the children of Israel at the edge of the promised land. And all the things that God has in the promises that the Holy Spirit applies to our life, um, heavenly rewards, um, the kingdom of God, that we can inherit this. We can inherit eternal life now and in the future. And eternal life is not just heaven. Eternal life is everything that is the kingdom of God. So eternal life is the kingdom of God in this world and the world to come. It's not just forgiveness. It's bigger than that. Eternal life is experiencing the Holy Spirit. Eternal life is seeing answer in prayer. It's the eternal life, not just in the future, but now the first tastes of the fullness to come, the first samples of the full banquet are available for us now. And as we obey God, we become inheritors. We inherit. He's got so many good things for you. So many good things for me. I know we'll go. We're still in a fallen world. We still have to face the, the truth of fallenness until we're resurrected. But there's so much to get from God because of the gospel. So much to experience, so much change and transformation that can take place in our lives. As I've said, so much breakthrough in prayer, um, so much kingdom of God being amongst us. And we don't have to wait till heaven to get it. We can inherit by faith. And this is the gospel in a nutshell. Thank you, Pastor Peter.